Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Lines podcast. Today we have Sean Lipman, CEO of Feedonomics, the leading full service feed management solution provider for multi channel retail. Sean, I'm so excited to have you on the show and not only dive into your background and your experience, but also what you're doing with Feedonomics. I was looking to the, you know, the kind of the function of the business and it's so fascinating, especially as we think about sustainability and how companies can just be more intelligent and strategic about what they do within their organizations and Really excited to see how that process has been going. But before we get into all that, tell me, what's more challenging, winning a rugby scrum or building a company? Well, that's a good question. You know, having played rugby all my life, I think there's a tremendous amount of learning that you get from both. Uh, you know, at its core, rugby is a very big sport, but it's also the consummate team sport. You know, I'm yeah. obviously biased, so I'd say it's probably the most consummate team sport. And so the learnings you get from rugby are directly transferable into building, running, and growing a business. And candidly, a lot of the learnings I've had in my life in terms of learning how to lead and grow a business have actually come from my experience in playing sports and specifically rugby. Yeah. What in, what in particular do you think is, is yeah, I, I've never played rugby. I'm, I was more of a football, basketball guy. So there's obviously some learnings I took from there, but a lot of my friends who played it, just there's so much cooperation on the field into getting, you know, a, a score and, and, and there's so much communication involved, even while you're playing. What in particular are a couple lessons that you particularly kind of look at as, as teaching that you take, take into, to lead your own team now? When you look at a sport where if you don't do your job, not only can you get scored on, but you can actually get hurt at the same time. So there's it's, that element. That's, that's very relevant, but like anything, it's a, it's a puzzle, right? It's a sport right. of multiple player positions, all that have to do a certain job in order to accomplish a, a goal. And within the context of running a business, it's the same puzzle. Yeah. And if all of the pieces of that puzzle aren't executing and functioning and collaborating and communicating and battling together for the same common goal. Yeah. You're typically going to have fractures. Yeah. And it's those fractures which typically sink companies in, in, from our perspective. And so in the context of Philodomics, we started the company about eight years ago, more than eight years ago now. And uh, actually it was founded by me and my very best friend since we were 18 years old, who we played rugby together since we were well into our old, older days and then two brothers. And so there was an element of trust that we had from the very beginning yeah. where there wasn't a lot of politics. There wasn't a lot of positioning. It was just about how do we come together to get the best outcome and for each other. But before we even hired any employees, we brought a set of principles into the company and yeah. which are founded off of the, the, the New Zealand all black rugby team, which is the, arguably the most successful sporting team of all time. Had yeah. good years, 90% win rate. And we took this, the, these 15 principles that are kind of the consummate DNA of what has made them successful over such a long period of time. Team, companies, organizations, they have their moment in the sun. But the question is, how do you create, perpetu how do you perpetuate success? How do you create a successful paradigm that will continue? as the business grows and just yeah. like any business, it goes through a whole bunch of different phases. And so how can you keep that essence, even though you grow with 450 people now, part of a public company and how have we managed to still continue growing, dealing with adversity, staying at the cutting edge in technology, which is a very competitive space, but still hold ourselves true to those underlying principles that for the most part are the essence of any successful team. And we implemented those principles before we had any employees. Yeah. And since then we have everybody read the book, the principles, but it's not about, you know, having a set of principles that you put up on the wall. It's about living them every day. And that's the hard part for leaders and for companies is it's one thing to say, we're all going to behave in a certain way. We're going to create this specific type of culture. But it's another thing to actually hold yourself yeah. at the highest level accountable to doing it because people don't follow because of what you say. People follow because of how you behave and what you do. 
Yeah. And so I think with any kind of company, it's very critical to really understand your how and understand yeah. your why before you figure out your what. Yeah. And a lot of times companies are very focused on the what. And when you're in technology and when you're in e-commerce and all the peripheral industries that we're in, involved in, if you don't really understand and you have a really strong North Star about your how and your why, you can get really lost in the what because it takes yeah. away the ability to be innovative. And innovative companies are questioning companies. They're ones that encourage a level of healthy conflict. They organizations that encourage a level of questioning and creating a safety for people to ask. And when you translate that to sports, when you look at the greatest sporting teams in the world or very, very well-coordinated teams that could be a theater group, when they've got that same culture of trust and a questioning environment where they're encouraging yeah. people to ask, what that does is it creates innovation. Yeah. And when you have that, you have the ability to continue growing, succeeding, and competing in, in, in business. Yeah. How, and how do you do that if, if I'm a founder and, and you know, kind of wanting to reinstall these principles and values and make sure that my team is, is kind of in, in agreement on where the North Star is? How do you mechanically instill that if it, you know, doing a check-in every, yeah, every week or every day in, in your stand-ups or, or your, is it, you know, having kind of off-site and on-site events? How do you kind of maintain in that culture? Because culture is an organism and it, and it doesn't just live once and continue living on. It needs to be fostered and, and it changes, you know, slightly as, as you, know, you, you add on more individuals to your team. How do you guess if I'm a founder, what advice would you give me in terms of reinstilling that with my team? What, should, what would I be doing on the daily or weekly or monthly to make sure that we're all headed in the right direction? You've got to be obsessively, compulsively obsessive about it. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be, it's got to be so important to you that it keeps yeah. you awake at night worrying that your culture and your level of engagement with your people is going to be freeing. It's a natural process when a company scales and grows, especially us. We grew, you know, over eight years from nothing to 300, you know, 300, 450 people. Yeah. And if, and it's very natural that as you start growing very quickly and as you have a lot more people, it's easy to say, well, we have too many people, you know, that's, you know, that's not, you know, you can either just say that it's not that important, it's very difficult to do, or busy. So you have to, it, it has to mean a lot to you. So you've got to get it at a very visceral level. If you're doing it because it seems like a cool thing to do, you read it in a book, you heard a podcast, and it was like, oh, there was this cool leadership construct about really focusing on culture. Yeah. Uh, culture is not a thing you talk about. It's a thing you live. You embed it in your DNA of your organization. Yeah. And if you're not willing to double down and triple down on it, you will be found out because yeah. you're going to come to times in a company where you're going to have problems and challenges. And so now you've got to decide, well, how important is the culture to me now? Now that we're losing customers, now that the economy is turning, now that we'd be getting competitors or maybe poaching some of our customers or our people. And that's when you get tested like anything in life. It's not when things are good. It's when things are tough. Yeah. And that's when your principles and your culture becomes the foundational glue that allows you to mobilize your people to roll up their sleeves and be willing to take sacrifice with you. Yeah. But you can't ask your people to take sacrifice with you if you're not willing to sacrifice yourself. Yeah. So there's a level of servant leadership that's critical. You know, I yeah. look at a business that, you know, like a chandelier to some extent, you know, people always talk about org charts. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, the org chart, the, the reason why you have the senior leadership is they the, the anchor to the roof. Yeah. But the shining crystals are the ones that are closer to the ballroom. And those are your people. Those are the ones in the, that are front and center with your clients, with your partners. Those are the ones that are doing the work every day. Yeah. So if you don't mobilize your organization around giving those people the best opportunity to succeed and to prosper and to be fulfilled, then you, you're not going to compete at the best level. And that's no different than a, a sports or business. Yeah. And you got to have that commitment to really try to empower your people and try and give them an opportunity to flourish 
And then when times are tough, what people do is they say, this is the team I want to play on. It's not about money. It's not about stock. It's, it's about, I'm going to pitch up and do good and do well for my teammates. Yeah. And so I think a lot of that comes from our foundation in sports. And then I've played on sporting teams and worked in companies where that was not there. And typically those were not successful businesses or sporting teams. Yeah. I mean, you talk, I've heard of this concept a lot, especially, you know, I think it's more popular as nowadays, but it's been something that's been around for a while, which is a servant leadership concept. You know, and I think, I think we all might have an idea about it, but for, for those who maybe aren't successful practicing it, or, you know, maybe aren't seeing the, the key components, what does it mean to be a servant leader in, in, in your day to day? You know, as a servant leader, you come into the work and what are you focused on? What are you kind of keeping at in the, in the top of your mind to make sure all your employees and your whole company is kind of not only staying afloat, encouraged, but supported to move in the right direction. What does that servant leadership concept mean to you? I think a big part of it is gratitude and humility. Yeah. You know, a lot of business owners think because I'm paying my employees paycheck or because I'm giving them health benefits that I'm the one who's doing them the favor, right? The transactional yes. nature of the, the employee employee relationship. But the reality of it is it, it's, it's a two-way street, right? You, you, you have to create an environment where your people want to work with you and for you for more than a paycheck, for more than the health benefits. You want them to have a broader purpose. And as a general rule, every person needs to have a broader purpose in life than just the work they do. Yeah. And so if you, can, if you can really articulate that, and it's not about having billions of money, you know, in dollars in capital funding. We did it without any money. We didn't raise a penny at our company. Wow. So a lot of times people say like, oh, you can only do that if you've got a lot of money. You know, if you've got capital, then you can invest. That's not true because you're not investing the money, you're investing the time and the energy and the focus of understanding that every single person that comes to you has a whole set of gifts. They obviously yeah. have some competency, or potential competency to do the job they're going to do. But every person that comes to us has got a life experience. You lived in Sonoma, you went to school in, in, in Santa Barbara, you studied certain things, you're interested in certain things, you've had life experiences. So every person that comes into the company is a teacher. The day they start with you, they can teach other people things. Not necessarily immediately about the work, but about their life experience. They have a world view. And so if you can unlock that and you create an environment where every single person that's coming in has, is a contributor from day one, yeah. they can contribute to your culture on day one by, by buying into the fact that you have the special culture and they, and then the minute that they start de developing skills within the company, they start yeah. wanting, if you create the environment to teach the people that come behind them, the best way to do things. So your teachers, you, you, you're turning all of your employees, all of your, your, your team members into teachers and you're facilitating yeah. an environment where they all become coaches, but they also become students and right. that's the whole concept of creating a learning environment. And if you can unlock that, um, it's easy to compete because most of the people we compete against, that's not what they're doing. Yeah. And then that translates to the relationship and the experience that your customers have with you because at the yeah. end of the day it's not you as the owner or the boss who's paying your employees paycheck right the people that are paying your employees paycheck are your customers yeah and so you have to give them an environment where they're going to be best positioned to do what you promised your customers you're going to do for them to make good on their promises and so if you're not serving them well and giving them and, and treating them with the right respect, but also giving them the right tools, whether it be physical or emotional. Yeah. How are they then going to go and take that to your customer and execute with your customer where you behaving in one way, but expect them to behave in a different way for your customer. And I guarantee when you see companies that have poor service and poor responsiveness and poor engagement with their customers. You go look inside that company and you'll find that there's poor engagement, poor responsiveness, all of the things that are manifesting with themselves with their customer that's happening inside that company, guaranteed. 
Yeah. So there's some yeah. companies that have their moment in the sun and they manage to get successful despite themselves. But I say that's the exception and not the rule. Exceptional Agreed. companies pay very, very significant focus to how they acquire their talents. And so a lot of, you know, what you asked, it really happens at the, before you even hire them. Yeah. Because if you don't ensure that you're bringing people in that have got the right cultural alignment with you, and it doesn't mean they're all the same people, but that they agree that those principles, the how of how you run your business is important to them and they want to be part of that, then the what they do takes care of itself. People learn how right. to do stuff. Yeah. And it's an interesting thing because you know, a lot of people, they say, you know, you know, what do you do? They say, oh, I'm a senior vice president of sales or I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a director of operation. But that's not who that person is. Who that person right. is, is they're a, they're a mother, they're a father, they're a brother, they're a sister. They, they like rock and roll. They like hiking, camping. Yeah. They, they grew up in Sonoma. That's who people are. And so if you don't pay attention to that, people get caught up in what they do versus who they are. Yeah. And yeah. who they are is what makes them do what they do well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I love that philosophy. And, and it also, it's interesting when you, you know, when somebody has a certain engagement or attachment or relationship with their work by how they answer the, what do you do question, if they leave with the title. Then, then they're a little bit abstract away from the actual mechanics versus if they're talking about the functions that either are exciting or necessary for them to have success. Like I engage with customers or I make sure that, you know, this, our product gets implemented into, you know, the clients that we work with so they can have success. That's a lot more involved in, in, in a healthier relationship, I think, with, you know, with the work that they do. And shifting focus to feedonomics, because I'm so excited about, you know, what you're doing and the whole the, this whole feed, feed management kind of concept, especially in, in, you know, I think a lot of companies because of the macroeconomic climate and because of, I think we've learned a lot in the evolution of technology and building, which is focusing on keeping not only track of, you know, things, information, data, supply that you have and optimizing it for not only, you know, the company's success, but its impact, you know, with its external environment. So talk about this idea of feed management and what inspired you to go from, you know, a successful, yeah, I think it was a healthcare and medical per provider company, then to focusing on e-commerce and companies with, with stock and, and keeping them focused and managed in, in the direction that they're going. Describe the concept of feed management and, and why is it important and, and what got you so excited about, excited about it eight years ago? Well, really, I mean, my, my story was really, I came in to help my best friend start up a new business, <laughs> right? So I, I didn't, I had done other businesses before. I, I, at the time I had some, you know, basically I wanted to come in and help Gary and, and then his two partners, Brian and Robert, who are arguably the two smartest, not so young anymore. When they were, when we started the business, they were 25 and 22. Wow. And they had already done their own businesses before. They're very, very exceptional young men. Well, you know, everybody's young right now for me, but they <laughs> fantastic talents. And it's a classic example of, of knowing there's an opportunity without knowing what the opportunity is, is I think the best way to describe this is. And that goes to, you know, when you go into entrepreneurship, having your eyes open, because sometimes what you think you're going to do is really just a journey or a pathway to the thing that you're going to do. And in that context, it's the classic example of trying to solve a problem for ourselves or a challenge for ourselves. And then looking at it and saying, we just built a better mousetrap and that's yeah. the business we want to be in. And so that's really how it evolved. It wasn't very, we didn't have a particular perspective when we all came together, we were running a, a performance marketing company and we had clients that needed this type of service to be able to take their products from their product catalogs, their websites, and effectively syndicate these products to the whole world, the advertising world, Google and Bing and Yahoo. Yeah. And after time, Facebook, all of these emerging as in channels, marketplaces like Amazon and eBay. But even at that time, really the whole social, the, the monetization or the commercialization of the social channels like Facebook and Instagram and now TikTok, 
really all of them have emerged now as commerce channels. They places where people advertise to sell stuff and yeah. where people can go and buy stuff. Yeah. And in order to achieve that, you need exceptionally powerful technology because yeah. the way that those product catalogs are housed, that the underlying source of truth is not the way that the products need to be syndicated at the places where people are going to shop. Yeah. And so we had some very, very challenging situations with one client that had over 1 billion products that we needed to ingest Could on a consistent basis and then pare it down to 25 million at any given time in real time and send it through to Google yeah. and other channels. And there was nothing that could solve for this. And so Robert and Brian said, look, we can build this for ourselves, for our client. And then we built it and we looked at it and we said, this is better than anything in the world, literally. The UI wasn't particularly pretty, and, and it, but the underlying functionality of it yeah. was game changing. And we pivoted. And that's what successful companies do. You know, to yeah. your point is that having the ability to not get so married to your concept. If we said, well, no, the performance marketers, that's what we do. Can't. And that's where it becomes the what you do versus the how you do it. The how right. for us has always been the same, but the what we do changed. And we said, well, that's the business we should be in. It's a technology. It's very sticky. What we're yeah. doing is we're building the plumbing, the piping yeah. for e-commerce. And so it's like the old stories of, you know, the old gold rush miners and it wasn't the people who were looking for gold that were making the money. It was the people who were selling the shovels and the, the wheelbarrows. Yeah. And to some extent, in a much more sophisticated way, what Pedonomics does is we're, we're selling the wheelbarrows and the shovels. <laughs> we're enabling the miners yeah. to go and find the gold, but we're the critical infrastructure layer at a technology level that takes all of this significant amounts of data, which is in this case, product data, optimizes the data so that when it gets to all the different channels, it's going to best give the seller the best possible opportunity for the product to be found, clicked on and purchased, but at a lower cost, and yeah. which are all the primary drivers to e-commerce, right? It's not just about getting your products out there. We do that. It's about searchability. Yeah. Creating an environment where when somebody's doing a search for red running shoes, there's a good chance your product will come up. Right. And then, and then provision it in, in a way that they're going to pay less for that particular click. But then we've expanded the technology now, you know, with the proliferation of marketplaces where the actual purchase is consummated at the actual marketplace, like yeah. an Amazon or an eBay. We're actually not only getting the products there, but also picking up the orders, sending it to the underlying e-commerce platform, and then picking up the shipping to let Amazon or eBay know that they've actually shipped the product for you. So yeah. it's, it's, it's really evolved into a very, very complex and very advanced system. And candidly, you know, from our perspective, and I won't take any credit for building it because, you know, I was trained as an accountant, but it's, 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 it's the most advanced scalable, powerful technology in the world for essentially connecting systems. So even though what we do is we're focused in e-commerce to a large extent, really what we're doing is we're connecting systems, disparate systems. Yeah. And that opens up our opportunity to solve challenges that aren't just e-commerce related, but anytime you're trying to take vast amounts of data from one or many systems and get it into another one, we're the middleware layer that's facilitating for that yeah. to happen. Yeah, it's incredible to see kind of how technology can improve the distribution or, or even the interaction with, you know, in this particular is, is e-commerce. And I mean, I, I get bumped by ads on TikTok and Instagram every day. And I'm going to be honest, I click on them because they're so bad. <laughs> they're so interesting and exactly what I'm looking for, or maybe you know, adjacent to that. But yeah. it's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the delivery of that and the sophistication behind not only the product, but the interaction with the platform to then promote that product at that moment in time. What goes into, I'm not sure if you know the mechanics of this or, or if you can illuminate us, what goes into the mechanics behind connecting your audience to whatever your product is through these different mediums? Obviously, you have data, you have all these reports, you have all the stock, you submit them and you, you know, move them in 
to be viewed by your, your, your client, your target audience, your customer, but how do you make sure it delivers them, delivers it to the right customer with having so many different products and so many different customers? How do you fight for that, that, that exposure? Relevance. Yeah. Relevance. That's the most critical, that's the word, you know, that's critical. And, and that's where the complexity of it comes because yeah. when you've got, let's call it raw data, right? And you're sending it out to, there's different types of channels. One are driven by search and yeah. the other one is driven by the actual platform delivering it to you based on their assessment that it might be something that's applicable to you. So with Google, Google's not necessarily feeding it to you. You're doing a search yeah. and then Google say, okay, I think that there's a strong chance based on that search that you're going to want to see this product. Now, if they don't get that right, they're going to be losing their value to customers because they're going to say, every time I do a search, I'm yeah. getting garbage. I'm not getting stuff that's yeah. relevant. Right. So they have to be able to send you an image or an ad that will most likely be as relevant to what you were said you were looking for. And yeah. searches are very, sometimes very, very specific. I want a Nike Air Jordan, yellow size 13. Other times yeah. you just say, I'm looking for a, uh, a running shoe, right? Or a basketball yeah. shoe. Yeah. But then the other one is like on a Facebook, they are having to look to see what your general, your profile, <laughs> the things you like, the things that you're looking, all of your indicators to say that based on your behavior, we think that this is going to be something that's relevant to you. In either one, categorization and optimization of what you are sending to them is critical. Yeah. So that's where we come in because the underlying data may not have any of that attributes that are going to inform the platform what, what that thing is. Yeah. So we use AI <laughs> to be able to understand that if it's a, a, if it's a, a dress shirt, is it a dress? Or is it a shirt? Yeah. <laughs> right? So right. we're able to categorize that automatically to actually inform them that, no, when we send something to you that says it's a dress shirt, it's either, it's actually a shirt. Yeah. And by being able to provide that added context to the advertiser, the chances of that product actually being provisioned to someone who actually wants to buy it becomes enhanced. And mm -hmm. that's where the power of what we do really comes to the forefront. It's, we obviously able to hand hundreds of millions. We, we handle a 13 billion product lines a day going through yeah. our platform, but it's not just about trying to get the data to the, to the end, to the user. It's about getting it to them in a way that as it filters through Fedonomics, we've changed yeah. it and transformed it so that when it ends up in the, the, adverti the advertiser, there's going to be a better chance for that seller's product to actually be provisioned to someone who's looking for it. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier in the show that now Feed Anomics is part of a public company and, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but what was that transition like and, and how is that relationship now for those companies who don't have, say, an, an added partner, you know, they're, they're kind of trekking along on, on their own, but when other people get involved or other companies get involved, I'm sure things kind of dynamically change a little bit, but Discuss how you got into that relationship and what is the current way you kind of manage and, and facilitate that and still kind of stay innovative rather than having expectations set on your own company? Look, it's a great question. I looked, I've been through a few acquisitions in my life and there's different outcomes typically when you have acquisitions like that. I have never seen in my life a transaction where the acquirer has been so astute in understanding the underlying value of the asset that they purchased. Yeah. And what I mean by that is they've been exceptionally respectful and responsive to the fact that we're better separate in many respects. We get all the benefits of being part of them. We get the benefits of both worlds because we get the benefit. There's a lot of firepower that a public company provides. I cut the company's big commerce. They're a fantastic company. Yeah. So a lot of our people, we were a bootstrap, a company owned by, you know, a few startup guys who didn't take any capital. So what's happened with us now being part of BigCommerce is, you know, our people get access to things that we weren't able to give them in the past. Stock options, much better healthcare, big yeah. company benefits, and also access to their partner network, tremendously skillful and capable people. But at the same time, we're separate. 
And yeah. we're running as a separate agnostic company because we are, we connect the Sparrow systems. We, we have to be able to support everybody. Yeah. And they've been particularly astute in understanding that the value that Feedonomics brings is by helping everybody. Yeah. And typically sometimes a company will acquire a company and integrate it into them, get, yeah. take them out of the ecosystem. Our value is in being in the ecosystem, helping yeah. everybody, being agnostic. And so in that regard, they've been an amazing partner for us. Yeah. And yeah, you know, on the one end you can say, well, that's obvious because we're such a great company, but that doesn't always happen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they've leaned into our culture. A lot of times an acquirer, you know, says, you know, we've, and they've got a very, very strong cultural foundation, which is amazing. So I just think the lack, sometimes the lack, sometimes by design, you can't always choose who's going to buy you. But in this case, we were very fortunate that we're very aligned in terms of how we want to go to the world. We want to enable all of the world to yeah. be able to benefit from connectivity. Yeah. And, and then there's a very strong alignment on culture, which I think is a big reason why it's been such a very successful transaction for everybody. Now yeah. people, I would argue every single Fido is in a better place today. Not that they weren't in a good place with us before, but in terms of the trajectory for their careers and what we can offer them, because we're able to offer them growth. You know, at the end of the day, you know, a company that is continuing to grow provides more opportunity for its people. Yeah. And, and, and I think in that regard, it's just been an exceptional experience. I think hopefully for them as well, but I think so for sure, but definitely for our people and, and for the market itself, because we're able to bring to our customers in certain cases more than we had, than we were able to cobble together. There's a whole partner ecosystem that we're able to bring into our clients now. And big commerce have tremendous relationship at the highest level with a lot of the like advertising channels yeah. that we were not necessarily as embedded in. And so I think all in all, it's, it's been the best of both worlds for everybody. Yeah. And what, what are some of the biggest challenges that Feedonomics faces today? Look, I think everybody is looking downstream at the economy to see What's going to happen in the next couple of years, yeah. right? You know, they are, you just have to read the news to say like, well, you know, how's that going to, what is the broad based impact going to be on the economy? I actually see it as a tremendous opportunity because typically when the economy goes through a bad spell, a lot of, a lot of companies go into a significant defensive posture. They hunker down, which you got to do. You've got to obviously be right. fiscally conservative and you've got to be squirrely, you know, make sure that you can fight, live to fight another day. But when you're a disruptor and the, the benefit for us is that big commerce have allowed us to continue being a, a disruptor, entrepreneurial disruptor. Yeah. And typically when a large company buys a smaller company, that's one of the things that goes out of the window, right? Innovation, disruption, scrappiness, and They've actually leaned into that. And so I think going into these next few years, if we continue doing what we're doing, which is just exceptional focus on creating value outcomes for our customers and obviously having the right customers, you've got to pick where you want yes. to play. We made a decision a long time ago that we were not going to be a, a FMB, support the SMB market. We went up, up market very quickly. We, yeah. we became. I'd say the premier mid-market and enterprise solution in the, in, in the world, even though really a, 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 more, a majority of our presence is in the U S but also we have a very big global presence yeah. through global brands. And in that regard, if you keep on living your principles, doing the right thing, competing, holding true to your values, you typically find your competitors don't do that. Yeah. For a lot of different reasons, they private equity manage, they, they just go into a defensive posture. And so I think for us, we have a tremendous opportunity to actually expand, even if there's a, a slowdown, because this business is not going to go away. It will definitely slow down. And then the other part of it is how do you take your product set or your solution set and bifurcate? You know, there's a whole concept of the growth curve. 
yeah. which we speak about a lot at the company, which is every, every company that goes through its life cycle is a bell curve. Yeah. And if you're not able to create a new bell curve before you get to the top, you typically have a failing company. Yeah. And so that's a risk or a challenge and an opportunity for every company to actually bifurcate off the bell curve and create a new one, which then gives you another cycle of growth. It puts you back into a entrepreneurial opportunistic mo moment. But the challenge is how do you keep the machine? Because we're a bigger company of 450 people. How do you keep the machine running? Yeah, but without stifling innovation and the ability to continue looking for your next growth curve. And I think just as long as you're very focused on that and being very deliberate about that, you have a good chance to sustain yourself. There's, there's no such thing as linear growth, right? Every yeah. business goes through these cycles. The key is being aware of it. And, and as long as you don't get arrogant or complacent, which I think are the two predictors for failure. Yeah. You have a good opportunity. You only stay grounded and you don't believe, you, you don't get too high when things are good and, and you don't get too low when things are bad. You probably have a good opportunity to weather the storm and come out on the other end. Yeah. I love the, you know, what you said about agility. And I think that's an underrated quality about a lot of companies. And I think uh, certain companies who are maybe disrupting or, or starting or you just smaller in a particular area can use that to their advantage. And you know, I, I run a company in particular that we're extremely agile because we have a tight team and, and we can move quickly. And it's been such a great, you know, a indicator for success because the quicker we can move or, or move in a different direction or adapt, it, it leads to a, a lot better business results. And just being flexible in that whole mindset about, you know, caring for your customers and, and kind of catering to them is what I think, you know, makes a lot of companies successful. And I was kind of like to ask this question just to get to the snapshot of, of a founder's mind, but if you weren't working on this, what would you be working on? I, you know, look, I, I'm driven by a couple of things in my life. One is purpose. The other one is impacting people in a positive way, hopefully. And, you know, we have this concept at the, the, this book, Legacy, which is what we kind of is the book that we use as our kind of guiding principles. Is a whole concept about being a great ancestor. And from a rugby perspective or sporting perspective, leaving your, leaving the Jersey in a better place. Yeah. And it really resonated with me, you know, when I, when I read the book, it just totally made sense is that you know, you're, you're on this earth for a very short period of time for the most part in the biggest scheme of things, or you're involved in a company for a relatively short time and you're, you're, and so you, you have a, an opportunity to leave a mark, right? And if I wasn't doing this, I would probably be looking for something else that will do those things for me. Give right. me purpose and give me an opportunity to potentially pay it forward by being a great ancestor, helping other people learn, grow, build, not make the same mistakes that you know, sometimes you've got to make the mistakes. That's how yeah. you learn, but I'd be looking to do the same thing I do. This business provides me a very unique opportunity. I'm a coach. I've, I've evolved into a coach by nature. I was a player. And there's a very kind of singular mindset to being an individual athlete. It's, right. There's a selfishness. Even if you're in a team sport, there's a selfishness to it. And then I went into coaching and uh, it was a, a very, very um, transformational thing for me, even though I had run companies. And, uh, but when you start looking at leadership from a coach's and mentor's perspective, it changes the way that you problem solve. It changes the way that you, you recognize how you unleash talent, right? The job of a good coach is to unleash great talent to then work together in a way that they can have a really positive outcome. This is a general statement. I would just look for other coaching opportunities. This one affords me a unique one because it's the team I love. It's the team I've been a part of for such a long period of time. And it's fantastic to see how that team is evolving and growing. Yeah. So it's very fulfilling. Gives a, a lot that. of fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I, that answered your question. No, it did. <laughs> it did. It did. So it did. for me, it doesn't matter. You know, it yeah, doesn't matter yeah. if it's technology or if it's healthcare. Or, at the end of the day, the dynamics of every business are exactly the same. Yeah. You, you have a customer, your customer pays for your product and service. You made a commitment and an obligation to them to do it. And then you've got to build everything in your business around doing that. Yeah. And if you do that, it doesn't matter what you do, you'll be successful. If you 
become inwardly focused, you're obviously not taking account of what your customer needs and there's no reason for them to use you. Yeah. I mean, you summed up so many episodes, you know, in talking to founders and, and how, you know, there's such a repetition of business and the products can be interchangeable. The customers can be interchangeable, but the principles behind, you know, having success is, is just, you know, exactly what you had said. And Sean, I know we're coming up to the end of the episode and I think I could talk to you on hours on end in terms of not only philosophically and leadership, but also, you know, get into topics in terms of the, the, you know, not only kind of with the direction of, of marketing and, and especially advertising and how companies are connecting with their customers. But I think, you know, if Peter Nomics has a, has a special insight into that, but I always like to ask this next question as a, you know, not only for selfish research purposes, but as a way to give some more kind of homework for the audience to, to look into more piece of information, but whether it was earlier in your career or now, and outside of the book legacy, what books or people have influenced you the most? I had a mentor, right? So when I, when I came out of, I was in public accounting, I was, a, I was an accountant and for the most part, I, I, I was always looking to be in business. I, you know, yeah. the accounting for the most part is a great way to enter into business. You know, you work with other companies and you meet other, and I met a founder of a company, uh, how many years ago, 30, 33 years ago, 33 years ago. And he encouraged me to leave public accounting and come join him as a, as his controller, as his CFO. I was 23 years old. It was a younger company. It was about two or three years old at the time. Yeah. And, and he insisted that I did everything in that company. He didn't hold me, he didn't let alone hold me back. He he forced me to go out of my comfort zone. Yeah. And, and so he was a fantastic mentor in that regard because he was relentless in his expectations of what I would do. He knew that he could push me because I wanted to push myself. I told him from the first day that I met him that I didn't want to work for anybody. I wanted to have my own company. And he, he said, listen, you know, listen, you're young. So why don't you come work with me for a few years and, and then go and do whatever you want to do. And that was the best decision I ever made because he taught me how to become, how to run a company. Even though you think you know everything, yeah. you're entrepreneurial, it, it, it really helps to have a good mentor and it really helps to be able to model and learn from yeah. somebody who's not only interested in teaching you, but insisting on teaching you. Yeah. And that can also be frustrating, but luckily I was able to. And I think that that experience with him set me up to be able to go out after, you know, I was with him in that company for about eight years. Wow. And then I went out and started my own companies after that. I've been doing that since then. But I think if I didn't have that underlying experience with him, and then I've done a lot of things with him since then. He not only started off as a mentor and a boss, but he became yeah. a lifelong, his name is Jeremy Levy. And he became a lifelong friend and business partner and, yeah. you know, the whole thing. Got father to my kids. So there's a, four, there's, I guess the summary of that is find a great mentor. Yeah. In that case, he was definitely one. I wouldn't have learned what I did. And then the other one is become a student, study everything. There's a whole concept of great coaches don't make stuff up themselves. What they do is they steal from everybody. Yeah. Right? Fact. You steal from everybody, but then you make it yours because we all have different personalities. Yeah. So the magic of it is, is looking at the best, whether it's sports coaches, business coaches, and reading and seeing what they do. The one person from our perspective that if you were to say like, who would you emulate yourself? Bill Campbell, who there's a book about him called the, 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 the trillion dollar coach. Yeah. I don't know if you've read it. I've heard of it before. It's been, it's been recommended. Yeah. Great book. Great book. There's a fantastic guy, very interesting guy. And uh, you know, all of the leadership books and that I've read, like that was the one when you read about the way he approaches leadership and how he manages people and manages companies the closest to how I'd like to think I try manage and, and yeah. grow. I'm more like the, the $50,000 coach, <laughs> it's a trillion dollar coach, but it's always good to aspire. So yeah. I think just constantly being in learning mode is the critical piece. Just never, ever think you know everything. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, it's been incredible and not only learn about your background, your experience, but also where you're taking Petonomics and where the current state of the company is. And then, you know, I think 
philosophically leadership is, is it, it's it's easy to kind of aspire with with certain principles and values but instilling them in your team and, and kind of focusing and being obsessive about them like you mentioned i think of something where people may not get or may not practice as well and and it's such a great reiteration to those concepts to have you kind of explain the story and and also explain you know what it does for you and your company so sean i know we're at the end of the episode and we'll have to do a round two one day but Thank you so much for being yeah. on the show, well, and I hope th- you enjoyed th- yourself. Thanks for doing this. A big shout out to you. I think it's pretty cool what you're doing. It's Appreciate it. it. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to chat with you. And it's really amazing to see how you're kind of instilling all of this thought sharing amongst, you know, the, the next generation. I yeah. Think it's just pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that so much, Sean. And like I said, we'll have to have a round too, but thank you again for being on the show. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Uh, just thank cheers. you.